Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the No Silicast Podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, September 29th, 2024, and this is show number 1012. Okay, Steve says I should have said 1,012, but that's too many syllables, so maybe I'll go with 1,012, 1,012. I don't know. We're going to have to come up with a consistent way of naming these, but uh, I'm getting used to this four-digit number thing, okay, guys? In Programming by Stealth this week, we had a very unusual lesson. Bart Bouchatz and I are both students, while the instructor is the delightful Helma Vanderlinden. We learned about model view controller last time with Bart, kind of the structure and what it's for and why you would have this design pattern for how you organize your code. But this week, Helma teaches us how she implemented this model view controller thing for our project xkpasswd-js. That's the project that's controlling the code that you see when you go to xkpasswd.net to generate your long, strong, and memorable passwords. Now, I'm confused a lot in this episode, but with Helma's patience and Bart jumping in from time to time to clarify things for me, and sometimes Helma has to clarify things for Bart, I think they succeed at helping me understand this newfangled structure of our code. I should mention, by the way, I'm calling it newfangled, but Model View Controller's been around for more than a decade. I forget how long, maybe it's 20 years. In any case, look for Programming by Stealth in your podcatcher of choice, and you can follow the link in the show notes to follow along with the show with Helma's fabulous tutorial show notes. When I was preparing my workshop for MacStoc, I knew that I'd be in a big room with the audience pretty spread out and far away. I was going to be teaching my tiny Mac tip series, so it was going to be a live demo. I started looking around for some apps to help make the experience better for the audience. The first thing I knew I would use is the accessibility setting that allows you to scroll with your trackpad or mouse to zoom in and out on the screen. If you haven't ever enabled that, no matter your age or visual acuity, I highly recommend having it enabled. To enable the feature, you open System Settings, Accessibility, and go to Zoom. First, you toggle on Use Scroll Gesture with Modifier Keys to Zoom. Now, the default modifier key is Control, but you can choose to change that if you like. The default zoom style is Full Screen, which I favor, but you can change that behavior too. I do like the full screen best, so I don't change anything in here other than toggling it on. You can play with the options and see which makes the most sense to you. Once you have this scroll to zoom feature turned on, it's handy for your own needs, like trying to see the ever shrinking road names in Apple Maps, but it's terrific when doing a presentation. During MacStock, I probably used control zoom 30 or 40 times to show people what I was doing on stage. In fact, I taught it as one of the tiny tips, and then every time I used it, I mentioned that I was using that same thing, control zoom, so they could see what I was doing. And I think if they remembered anything, it was probably to do this one feature. So you do have to get into your mindset to always picture yourself as sitting in the back row and trying to see. While you're picturing yourself in that back row, also remember to repeat the questions when people ask them and they're not on mic. It's one of my biggest pet peeves when someone on stage doesn't repeat a question because they heard it just fine and you know the people in the back or the people who watch it recorded later can't hear. So you'll often hear me in the middle of a presentation going, repeat the question, even if I could hear. I'm doing it for the people in the back and the people on the recording. All right, so that control zoom trick helps the audience. But I started wondering whether there were apps out there that would add even more enhancement to the user experience during my presentation. I decided to start my search in Setapp, and I found an application called Presentify by Ram Patra from presentifyapp.com. The problem Presentify sets out to solve is to help you draw attention to something on screen while presenting using arrows, boxes, circles, and text. Presentify is available for a one-time cost of $7 in the Mac App Store, or you can get it with your, subs, your setup subscription. In the Mac App Store, you'll see in-app purchases, but Ram added that simply as a tip jar, just in case you keep using Presentify and you want to throw him a bit more money because he's doing a great job keeping the app up to date for you. I like that approach. $7 for life and all versions is a great deal, but obviously a developer could use some more funding from time to time to keep the app in active development. You can control Presentify's functionality completely through keyboard shortcuts, or you can use the Presentify menu bar app. By default, if you toggle on Presentify, you'll see a floating control strip at the top of your screen. 
You'll see five colors to choose from, along with icons for freeform drawing, arrowed lines, rectangles, ovals, and text. You pick a color, tap on an icon, and then draw away on your screen. I'm not much for that whole freeform scribbling thing. I'm a little too structured, but I love being an obvious rectangle or a nice arrowed line to point at something. I've never been a fan of ovals and circles because it's always so hard to encompass the item you're trying to highlight, but a rectangle or an arrow usually works better. When you're doing a presentation, it's pretty rare that you would want to have an annotation stay up on screen indefinitely, so Presentify automatically has the annotations fade away after two seconds. Next to the five colored icons, there's a curious icon of two kind of intertwined curvy arrows. This delightful option creates annotations that are gradients of random colors. So you draw a rectangle and it goes from purple to pink to yellow, maybe. Now, while I wear rainbow pattern prescription glasses, I tend towards plain old red for my annotations. If it brings you joy, though, Presentify has you covered with a rainbow option. Now, the final control on this little control strip is an eraser. You can use that to quickly erase an annotation you've just put on screen. The floating control strip, strip is visible to your audience. If you think that's distracting to your intended audience, from the menu bar app or with a keyboard shortcut, you can choose to annotate without controls. Once enabled, hit the F key for free form, R for rectangle or square, C for circle or oval, A for arrow, or T for text. I figured all of those out just by poking the keys. Getting out of text is a little bit harder because if you type R, it would type an R instead of invoking the rectangle. So you, it's hard to get out of text. I couldn't find an easy way to get out of it other than to hit escape twice or control A, which disables pre Presentify, and then you can hit control A to turn it back on. I feel like there should be a way to get out of text, but I never did find it other than the two ways I just explained. Probably the most useful option in Presentify is called interactive mode. In this mode, you can toggle back and forth between interacting with your applications and annotating the screen. First, you enable interactive mode from the menu. You'll see a brief pop-up telling you to hold down the function key, or FN, to enable interactive mode. Then from the menu, enable Presentify with or without the on-screen control strip. Now, let's say I'm flipping slides in Keynote using my keyboard, but I want to draw an arrow. I simply hold down the function key, type the letter A, and I can draw that sweet arrow to point to something in my presentation. I can let go of the function key, and I'm back to interacting with my Mac. It's often useful to have your cursor highlighted in some way so the distant audience doesn't have to try to strain to try to find that tiny pointer. Presentified has you covered here too. With the highlight cursor option, your cursor is surrounded by a big pink hollow ring. You can't miss it. Now, I told you I figured out the keyboard shortcuts by, for the different tools by experimenting, but then I discovered that if you have Presentify enabled to annotate, you get another option in the menu bar to view all annotate shortcuts. And boy, howdy, are there a lot of them. You can select the color by number if you can remember five numbers, like is five pink, is three blue? You gotta remember that. You can increase or decrease the line weight of your annotations with the right left square brackets. That one's really easy to remember because it's standard in a lot of image applications like Apple Photos, Affinity Photo, and Photoshop. There's a highlighter you're supposed to be able to invoke with H, which works well in regular annotate mode, but if you're in interactive mode, macOS takes over that keystroke and shows you your desktop with function H. Likewise, after you enter some text on screen with Presentify, you can simply scroll on your mouse or trackpad and the text will shrink or embiggen. I discovered in the Annotate Shortcuts menu that you can invoke a whiteboard mode. This covers your entire screen, with the exception of the menu bar at the top, with a gray rectangle that you can draw on. I'm not really sure that's super useful only with a trackpad or mouse to draw, but maybe there's some use cases you can think of. There are three tiny tips at the bottom of the Annotate Shortcut screen. As is true in many annotation tools, you can hold down the Shift key to draw a straight line with the Freeform Line tool. I might use it then if I could do a straight line. If you hold down the Option key while you're drawing a rectangle or circle, it will fill with a semi-transparent circle or rectangle. Finally, if you hold down the Control key while you're drawing, you can toggle the Auto Erase behavior. In general, I think it's a good thing that the annotations fade away after a few seconds, but sometimes you might want one to stay. So it's cool you can hold down the Control key to get it to stick around. Now you'd think, 
I would be done describing a $7 app by now, wouldn't you? Close, but the settings for Presentify give you even more control. On the General tab, you can start Presentify at Login, and you can also have your cursor highlighted with that big pink ring right when the application launches. Maybe you have a giant screen or multiple screens and you're always losing your cursor. This could be handy to keep an eye on it. On the Annotate tab in Presentify, you can change the five color choices for annotation, or as Ram refers to them, your favorite colors. You get to choose the five colors. Tap each one, and you get the standard Apple Color Picker to change the color. You can change the default line weight, too. Let's say you're always using the left bracket to shrink the line width on your arrows. You could just change it in, this, in the settings from bold to regular to thin. Remember the FN key invokes interactive mode? Well, if you've never figured out what the caps lock key is for on your keyboard, here's a hint. It makes the, the keys capitalized. Anyway, if you've never figured out what that key is for, you can use that instead of the function key in the settings. Screen annotations with Presentify vaporize in two seconds, like I said, but you can change that to anywhere from zero to 10 seconds, and you can even disable auto erasure of annotations. That explains why there's a manual eraser in the set of tools. Our cursor highlight has some options too. If you don't favor pink for some reason, you can change the color. You can change it from large to small so the little ring is kind of tighter in. You can make the border of the ring dashed instead of solid, and you can change the opacity of the ring itself. By default, it's 75% opaque, but you can set it from zero to 100. And we talked about keyboard shortcuts, and in settings, you can change the three main shortcuts toggling annotations, toggling whether you see annotation controls, and toggling the visibility of the highlight cursor. You can change which shortcuts apply to those. The bottom line is that if you want to maybe keep your audience awake a little bit longer by adding annotations to your screen during live demos or canned presentations, I think Presentify for the grand sum of $7 might be just what you need. Again, you can find it in the Mac App Store or it's included in your setup subscription. Well, you just heard me explain how I use the app Presentify to annotate my screen during that workshop I was teaching at MacStock. The problem I solved was that the audience was spread out in a large room and I needed them to see the detail I was showing on screen. I did use the control zoom feature that I talked about and Presentify did a lot to help the audience, but there was one more thing I wanted to solve. The workshop I was teaching was my Mac Tiny Tips, or is it Tiny Mac Tips? I, always, I think I named that wrong. Tiny Mac Tips implies the Mac is tiny. Anyway, I was teaching my Tiny Mac Tip series, and a lot of these tips involved using keyboard shortcuts. Now, I'm pretty good about saying things like, hold down Control T with your cursor between two characters that you want to swap. But it would be more vivid if they could see the keystroke when I was talking about it. I've used various tools over the years to display keystrokes, but they were generally inside tools for creating screencasting tutorials. I needed a tool that was independent of any other application. In my hunting, I found an open source free tool called Keycaster. And it's kind of one of those old school, you remember when they used to pull uh, vowels out like Tumblr took the E out? There's no E at the end of Keycaster. It's K-E-Y-C-A-S-T-R. Now, I don't want to scare you off if you're not a programmer, because the way you get Keycaster is a teeny, teeny, tiny bit nerdy. However, the application itself is not one teeny bit nerdy. You don't get Keycaster from the Mac App Store, and you don't download it from the developer's website exactly. You have two options. So let's back up a second. Imagine you're on a normal site for an app. How do you get an app? You see a big button highlighted that says download. A single click downloads the app, and sometimes it's a zip file. You double click the zip file, and you've got your app ready to move to your applications directory. With Keycaster, it's exactly like that, except the website is the developer's GitHub repository. You have to click a link to download the zip file, open the zip, and move the app to your applications directory. It's exactly the same. The only difference is that there isn't an obvious single download button. I put a screenshot in the show notes of the GitHub repo for Keycaster, but let me explain what you're gonna see. In the upper left, you'll see that you're in the code tab in GitHub with the releases tab highlighted, sub tab really. That makes sense, right? We want the released version of the software. Now the obvious attention grabbing section on the page currently says, as of the time that you're hearing this, fix modifier detection on Intel. 
Okay. Turns out that's the name the developer gave when committing the changes to the app that fixed the latest bug. That, that title has no meaning, zero meaning to you whatsoever, and might even make you give up because you're running on an Apple Silicon Mac, not an Intel Mac. In fact, that was my first reaction. Now, I'm saying that it, I'm reading to you what it says right now. It might say something completely different by the time you read or hear this article because it's the notes on the latest bug they fixed in the current release. So if they fix another bug between when I'm saying this and when you're hearing it, that title is going to be something different. So don't get scared away. I assure you, you are still in the right place. Below this headline, that's kind of weird. That's just the name of the bug fix. You'll see a section called assets. Under assets, you can see three links. The second two both talk about source code, and unless your developer wants to change the tool, you want to stay away from the source code. That leaves only one option. It says keycaster.app.zip. This is the link you want to click. This is the zip file. Now remember, all you're doing is going to the developer's site and clicking a link to download the app zip file. I went to such great lengths to describe this page because I used to run away when I was sent to GitHub repos because I didn't know what to click or what all this glop on the page meant. So now we've downloaded Keycaster in a single click. I mean, literally, you're going to go to the website I'm going to send you to, and you're going to click this link. Now that we've got it there, we've downloaded it, double-clicked it, and we've installed it. Now Keycaster acts like any other Mac app. In fact, while I was working on this uh, uh, review of the tool, I got a pop-up when I launched Keycaster telling me I had an update to the app. I didn't have to go to GitHub. I didn't have to mess around in there. I just agreed to install the update. So it acted just like a normal app because it is a normal app. Now, the second option to install Keycaster is through Homebrew. And we've talked about Homebrew before and how it's nerdy but easy. If you have Homebrew installed, the command line on the terminal, I'm sorry, the command on the terminal is brew install cask Keycaster. That's it. All right, instead of starting at this installation page for Keycaster, you can take a look at the homepage of the Keycaster repo where they explain a bit about the project and they include some cursory usage information and some nice screenshots. So I put a link in the show notes to the repo itself, uh, the upper level repo that gives you a little bit more information. But if you follow my first link, that's straight to the download. All right, this was an awfully long lead up. So let's finally have some fun with Keycaster. Once you launch the app, it can run as a menu bar app or as a normal app. As soon as you choose to start casting, when you use a keystroke using any kind of modifier key, in the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see the keystroke displayed. Now, this little display is very small and subtle by default. It's got a tiny white font and it's on a kind of a dark gray black bezel background. After you type the keystroke, the keystroke will fade away in about two seconds. Now, while technically Keycaster has fulfilled its promise of showing our keystrokes on screen, I don't find that the default settings are nearly as dramatic as I need them to be so that Dr. Drang can see what I'm typing from the back of the room at MacStock. Now, that's where the preferences for Keycaster come into play. The first tab in Preferences is the General tab, where you'll choose whether to run Keycaster as a menu bar app, as a regular app, which is often referred to as in the dock, or you can have it be in both places. I like it as a menu bar app since there's really not very much to it. By default, you can toggle this capturing or casting of this little display using the keystroke Control Option Command K, but you can change that. Also by default, preferences will show at launch, and of course you'd want to turn that off almost immediately. The second tab, Display, is where the meat of Keycaster lives. At the bottom of the Display Preferences, you can change the color of the bezel and the text. Screencast Online tutorials are created using an app called ScreenFlow, which can record and display keystrokes automatically. We use a nice, translucent, very professional-looking dark gray with white text, and that's great for these professional recordings. But I gotta tell you, if I'm gonna keep the Mac stock audience awake, I gotta do a lot more than that. So I changed the bezel color to bright red. By default, it has a font size slider, and it's almost all the way down to tiny. So I dragged it up to huge. Now on my 13-inch MacBook Air, the keystrokes are more than 20% of the height of the screen. Anyone watching my demos would be able to see these keystrokes from the International Space Station. So I explained that the keystrokes fade away after about two seconds. Just like it was with Presentify, you can change how quickly they fade using the Linger Time Slider. You can slide it all the way down to Instant, which isn't very useful, 
or all the way up to long, which uh, I timed at around seven seconds. That's kind of annoying and could probably be distracting. I find the default right around the middle is just right, but you can mess around with it to see what works for you. While you're messing around with the linger time, you might as well play with the slider for fade duration. You can have your keystrokes blink off instantly, or you can make them fade, and I'm quoting here, fast-ish. Now there's one slider in display preferences, actually there's two, but the first one that baffles me is entitled line break delay. It goes from short to long, and the tip says length of time before the line breaks. Okay, what line? We don't have any lines, we've got text. And why is the line breaking? To try to crack the code on this critical line break issue, I played around with some other useful settings. Display mode by default has the radio button selected for command keys only. I'm not sure where they got the de definition for command keys, but if you have this selected, it means that if you use either the command key or the control key with any other key combination, that will be displayed in the little display of Keycaster. But if you hold down, say, Option D, Keycaster won't display anything on screen. If you hold down Command Option D, both the command and option symbols will be displayed along with a capital D, even though you just held down a lowercase d. Now, if you switch the display mode to all modified keys, now any modifier key you use will be displayed. In addition to command and control, both shift and option will display when you add a character to the keystroke. That's kind of where I expected it to be. I'm not quite sure why uh, shift and option get left out. Now, the last one, <laughs> if you really want to drive your audience nuts and drive yourself nuts, you can choose all keys under display mode. Keycaster will literally display every single key you hit. If you type fast enough, you can type out entire sentences that will fill your screen. You'll even see the symbol for the space key between your words. Now, this option was the one I thought might give me a clue on that line break delay thing. I hypothesized that if I set the line break delay to long, when I typed so much text that the characters went to the edge of the screen, there would maybe be a delay before it broke to the new line. See that line break? I thought that's what it might mean. No. Short, long, and the line break delay slider had no effect on what I saw when I typed enough to fill my entire screen. I'm afraid this one's going to be left a mystery. I'm glad I experimented with the all keys display mode because I thought of a use for it. I have to get my eyes dilated twice a year, and I hate how long it takes for my pupils to shrink back to normal. I even make them give me a half dose, or if they have it, the baby dose, like the ones they use on little kids, because this medicine is so effective, excessively effective, on dilating my eyes. One of the main reasons I find it so irritating, other than that I can't go outside because the sun hurts, is that it's hard to play on my computer because I can't see when I'm typing. With Keycaster, I could at least have my own text blown up huge on screen as I type so I could see if I was making typos. If I see a problem while I'm typing, I could use the control zoom accessibility setting I told you about to find the mistake and fix it. Hey, it's worth a try as a solution. Now there's another option I don't understand from the display mode settings. It's a checkbox that says Apple modifiers. And this checkbox can be added to any of the three display modes we just talked about. So command keys only, all modified keys, and all keys. You can add this checkbox for Apple modifiers to that. I tried toggling Apple modifiers on and off with the other three options. And for the life of me, I can't see what it's supposed to be changing. Now, one thing you might expect to find in display preferences is a way to tell Keycaster where on screen you'd like to display the keys. I mentioned that it was in the bottom left, but wouldn't you think there'd be like a left, center, right, at least, where you wanted it on your screen? Well, there's a hidden feature, but you can simply drag the display anywhere you want on the screen, and Keycaster will remember it for the next time it's invoked. Now, you might want to slide the linger time up a bit so you have enough time to drag the, it, uh, the little display to your desired position, and then put linger time back to, to where you like it. Now, in my review of Presentify, I explained how the app can show your cursor as a big colored ring as you move it around on screen, defaulted to pink. Well, maybe that's a little too much distraction, and you just like to see it highlight where you've clicked on the screen, not always showing your cursor. Keycaster has this option under a dropdown called Display Mouse Events. It's off by default, but you can choose from three options. The first is called With Mouse Pointer. That means wherever you click, a thin red circle will briefly appear. 
Now, I wish it would show a bit longer or at least be controllable by that linger time slider, but it has no options. You click and it goes blink and that's it, disappears. Now, the second option is with current visualizer. This one's kind of odd. When you click, you see a representation of the Apple no button mouse where you normally would see those modifier keys showing up in the little display. It does show modifier keys as well, but it's kind of a shared interface. I guess its job is to alert people that you've clicked, but it doesn't show them where. If you want to really confuse the audience, you can choose with pointer and visualizer. This gives you the thin red ring where you click and gives you that representation of the mouse. It's very busy, especially if you've made your visualizer giant and red like I have. So finally, I'm going to tell you about the very first option on display preferences. It says selected visualizer, and there's a drop down that says default. That's what's selected. In other words, everything I've been teaching you about changing is the default method of working with Keycaster. The only other option in this drop down is called Svelte. With Svelte, you can't change the font size or the bezel color. You can't change the linger time or the delay. Instead, you get a medium size, dark gray translucent box that shows the modifier key symbols across the bottom. So you see the symbol for shift, control, option, and command. When you hold down one of these keys, they light up in the Keycaster's floating display. You have one toggle to work with, and that's to display all keystrokes or not. You can also set whether to display mouse events, but from keystrokes, it's all of them or just the, these uh, modifier keys. Now, I do have to say this Svelte mode is very clean, or Svelte as they say, but also whatever you type only shows for a brief instant in that Svelte display. I'd have to say it doesn't really solve the problem I was trying to solve because the keystroke isn't up there long enough for anyone but the most alert to notice. The bottom line is that Keycaster is an open source solution under the BS3 license, and it's been freely available for the Mac since 2009. That makes me think I should go back through my show notes and see if I did know about this years ago. That's the kind of thing I would do. Anyway, it's a wee bit quirky to install if you've not done a GitHub installation before. And I did have a couple of times where it hung up and I had to restart it, but I'm running on Sequoia, so eh, I'm going to forgive it for that. But remember, even though it does have this wee bit quirky way to install with GitHub, it's only a matter of clicking on the right thing, and now you know where to click. Since my workshop at MacStock was filled with keystrokes I wanted to teach, Keycaster was the perfect tool to keep the hecklers in the back row engaged. Now, if anyone figures out what Apple modifiers and line break delay means, I'd really love to hear from you. Now, we don't have any new patrons or PayPal supporters to announce this week, so instead, I'm going to reiterate my thanks to Helma for supporting the work we do here. She spent a lot of time writing out those show notes, putting up with my overwhelming number of changes to those show notes, and then she asked for a play date so I could help her set up her mic correctly to get the best possible audio, and she let me teach her how to use Audio Hijack to record both her voice and me and Bart from Zoom. Then she put up with my constant barrage of questions and helped all of the listeners to learn a valuable new skill. I just wanted to bring that up again to let you know it's not just monetarily that people can help the show. Speaking of Audio Hijack, right now, the makers of Audio Hijack, Rogue Amoeba, are having their 22nd birthday sale, where you can get 22% off any and all of their tools if you use the coupon code 22, all capital letters. Now, you know I love all of their tools, especially Audio Hijack, Sound Source, and Loopback, just to name a couple of them. If you've been hesitant to buy because of the cost, I would jump on this deal before October 7th when it expires. All of their tools work with macOS Sequoia, and they vastly simplify the installation process. Now, this sounds like an ad, doesn't it? I am not advertising for them. I have never advertised for them. I'd love to get money for to advertising for them, but they don't need to pay me because I say this stuff all the time. They've got fantastic support. These tools solve problems that nothing else can do. Uh, probably one of the best Apple developers out there. Anyway, you can read all about this discount and about the new way to install their applications and get that 22% discount with the coupon code 22, all caps, before October 7th by going to rogueamoeba.com. And I'm not even going to make you uh, learn how to spell rogue amoeba because it's hard. Just click the link in the show notes.
Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Security Bits with Bart Bouchotts. And it just took Bart and I 35 minutes to get Zoom <laughs> and Mac OS on two computers and uh, Audio Hijack and SoundSource to actually function. So don't touch anything, Bart. <laughs> My hands are in the air. I'm I'm recording hands free here. This is yeah. You'd think after what a decade and a bit of this, we'd have all of the all of the kinks figured out, and we'd never be surprised by anything. And then just out of the blue, it's like no, not going to work today. Whole new, whole new fun. In in basically every every app we needed to function was weird on both ends. Yeah, and so that's fun. And neither of us went Sequoia because then we could have blamed ourselves for being silly. But neither of us did that. No, no, no. It's not our fault. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. Well, let's get stuck in. Right. So uh, the first collection of stories I've put together under the heading, oh, sorry, feedback and follow up. These are stories you've talked about before that are back in the news. Um, and the first one, I put the fun label, consequences arrive for past failures. So <laughs> first up for some consequences are AT&T. They are paying the Federal Communications Commission in the United States $13 million for their 2023 data breach. I don't remember if there's been more since, but anyway, that, that's for that one. I don't know. They probably have more comeuppance to come. Um, and the Irish Who's, data... Uh, who gets the money? Does the government the get F the money or do I get some of that? Uh, well, if it's an FCC settlement, it means it goes to you. If it was a class action, it would go to all of the peoples. It's just, a, yeah. It pays for the FCC. Well, no, it's but one it, of those... The other way around. So FCC, they keep the money. It just goes down. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, if it was a class yeah. action, then you would get the money. Okay. So this way it, it pays for the investigators who found the problem. I, you know, pays a bunch of salaries. So that's no bad thing. Uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioners um, issued a ruling against Facebook. Now, they were a bit slower because in this case, it was dealing with a problem that came to light in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2019. So they've had five years to figure this out. Anyway, 91 million. I have my show notes say 91 euro. Uh, no, no, that is 91 million euro, <laughs> which is about 100 Do you want me to fix that? Dollars. Please. <laughs> I mean, I know Facebook make a lot of money, but 91 would be a pathetic fine, especially because it was 600 so. million passwords. Um, now, they didn't lose them. They just had them in plain text, so they could have lost them. And you're not supposed to do that in Europe. The GDPR says that you're not allowed to be careless, even if you get away with it. And so they were careless. So your show notes don't say who fined them 91 euro. Uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner is the link just underneath. Okay. So okay. basically... It just says meta fined. Okay. Yeah. So in Europe, because their headquarters are in Dublin, all of Europe's privacy law goes through the Irish Data Protection Commissioners. Okay, so this wasn't a, an Irish specific thing. No, our good old, our good friend, the GDPR, but Ireland wielded the stick. Also, I've realized the actual link link is missing from that. So uh, I guess you'll have to make do with the press release from the Irish Data Protection Commissioners because at this stage I've cleaned up my link tracker. Um, anyway, okay. yeah, the press hey, release. Can I add all. one more consequences sure. for past failures? I got the reason I asked who got who gets the money is uh, this week I got a check in the mail mm. from, uh, oh, shoot, who was it? Um, oh, the story would be way better if it was. It was, the, it was one of the companies that sells, uh, like lets you sign up to sell T-shirts and stuff with your own logos. I can't remember who it was now. Cafe this is bug me, but uh, Cafe Pre yeah, yeah, that's who it was. And I was always mad at them because they actually never paid me for the stuff that I, that I sold there. And I forget what their reason was, but they didn't pay me and uh, it wasn't much money. But I just got a check for $31 for the class action settlement. Excellent. Excellent. Because I remember them being on the naughty step. So I'm glad to see that's come through. I guess that's some yeah, sort of comeuppance. Yeah, I wasn't comeuppance. happy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, we talked a few times about Kaspersky leaving the United States. Well, they didn't go quietly. And technically speaking, they're, they're still allowed to be here for today and tomorrow. Um, but they left early uh, by deleting themselves, which is not too bad, and force installing an AV product no one's ever heard of called Ultra AV, which surprised the heck out of everyone when all of a sudden 
Their computers had a new AV product they did not recognise and a lot of people thought they'd just been hacked to be Jesus. Well, in a way they were. <laughs> right. I saw that. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, yep. that's crazy. Yeah. So whoever this ultra, I'm assuming they ultra, ultra AV paid a vast amount of money to Kaspersky to take over all of those customers. They just got yeah. handed a lot of people who may or may not continue renewing. So, yeah. Anyway, that that that's certainly a way to go out with a bang. So, thanks, Kaspersky. How did how 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 okay. could ah. they do that? Remember that an antivirus has to run at the absolute highest level of privilege on your system. You really, 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 really have to trust your AV vendor. They have as much power as your operating system, so they can. Jeez force install apps they are basically mm -hmm. a benign root kit wow yeah yeah this is why i'm very picky about who who gets to be av because it's a lot of power um, we didn't whether it's worth it <laughs> right well actually that's a fair point yeah it does sort of depend on your risk profile uh, we didn't go into too much detail about france arresting the founder of telegram because it was more of a law enforcement story than a cyber well it was a law enforcement story it wasn't a cyber security story uh, but it now has some actual impact um the reason he was arrested was because telegram just didn't answer any legal queries from law enforcement even those that they could answer and even those mm -hmm. they legally had to answer and that didn't seem tenable so they've changed their policy a wee bit, better late than never. Uh, they now actually will hand over IP addresses and phone numbers when they receive law enforcement requests, just like everyone else does. So this is a good story then? Absolutely. There is some okay. amazingly bad cybercrime that goes on on Telegram because they have a policy of, they actually make it a selling point that we don't hand over stuff to law enforcement. So shock and or horror, that attracts people who would like that to be true, right? This, it's like there's hosting companies in Iceland and a few places where their their selling point is, we don't answer law enforcement. And that's where all the malware is. Well, you know, Telegram was Jeez. forming the same function. So good. Yeah. Anyway, okay. consequences. Actually, I could have put that up in the consequences section. Um, the, another story that's gotten a lot of uh, Sturm and Drang is Microsoft's recall feature, which is one of those things that no one seems to have asked for, but Microsoft are convinced is the bee's knees and the future of all of life on Earth. This is a feature where they take screenshots every couple of seconds and then train their AI on it so we can help you. What was that email I answered last week? Why? I remember. And they didn't... I hope it's Clippy that jumps in and tells you. <laughs> <laughs> If it's not, someone should do a skin. That would be fantastic. Uh, either way, they have, uh, I think they're on their third rethink of this feature. Uh, it will now be off by default and be a purely opt-in feature, even if you buy their um, hardware specifically designed for it. It will also be completely removable under the add remove features section of the Windows control panel. And they're adding even more encryption to the storage of all of those screenshots of all of your everything. And they've also decided that AI could be used to automatically detect sensitive information and stop itself saving it in the first place. Then there wouldn't be nearly as much to protect in there. So that's actually AI helping AI, which is kind of clever. And also anything okay. you do in private browsing is never captured. Which seems like a very sensible thing to do if I turn on private browsing, you know, private. <laughs> exactly. So basically, they've now arrived at what I think should have been the beta version of the product. But hey, third time's a charm. You're, you're now at beta. Well done. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, I guess, Bless a positive development. Yeah, shouting at people helps. Uh, action alerts then. Apple have released all of their new OSs, which is obviously cool, but they have also patched all of their old OSs. So if you're running Mac OS Sonoma or Ventura or iOS 17 or iPad OS 17, you have security fixes that you should install. Um, you should also be aware that if you do choose to go to Sequoia, you're dipping your toe into a very freshly filled pool 
and there may be the odd piranha or something in there that didn't quite get cleaned up because we have not the world's most detailed reports and it certainly doesn't seem to be that no security tools work, but there are people who are having problems with third-party security tools on Sequoia and it seems to be down to a change in an API which, as best as I can tell, was marked as deprecated about five years ago and everyone should have remembered to update their product in the last five years. But code that's been working fine for 20 years and you don't read the release notes carefully, it it happens. You know, stuff that's deprecated gets forgotten about. So, you know, these are normal teething problems. I've noticed a few more teething problems than usual. Um, I get in, in an argument with Pat Dingler about this, uh, my friend, the uh, Apple consultant, and she says, no, nothing, nothing's gone wrong for me at all. And I'm like, OK, let me start counting the ways. I mean, they're not nothing has been showstoppery, but it's been a lot of little weird, naggy stuff that's been, uh, you know, just like that wasn't right. Nope. Shouldn't have done that. That's a problem. Um, yeah, also overcast, uh, the the. Um, iPad client will run on an Apple S- Silicon Mac. I can make it crash a hundred percent of the time by clicking on the magnifying glass. It's like, that okay, seems an easy fix. Where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I'm going to quote your dad. The plural of anecdote is not data. I'm having no mm. problems is a pretty. It, it's a datum, but in the grand scheme of things, a pretty meaningless datum in the millions and millions and millions of users of macOS Sequoia. So exactly, exactly. I, also, it's not very helpful when somebody tells you it doesn't happen to me. It's like, that doesn't mean it's not happening to me. Yeah, I often feel like, well, okay, um, and my first cat was called Min- Minnow. Um, we're exchanging useless <laughs> information neither of us care about, right? Oh my gosh, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. That's perfect. I or can't my take other credit. Favorite, that shouldn't happen. I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, no bleep, Sherlock. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, there was a stand-up comedian has that line where he just randomly in a conversation says, and my first dog was called called Wolf. Oh, what? We weren't sharing useless information either of us care about. And I thought that's such a good line. That's such a good line. Anyway. That is fabulous. If um, you switch- Well, we should, we should say that there was a uh, uh, catastrophic um, iOS 18, the iOS 18 that went out to uh, iPad OS. There were... Um, Many cases, not everybody, some cases of people having literally bricked iPads. And I hate the word bricked because people use it all the time when they mean, oh, it crashed and I had to reboot. No, these were really, really bricked. And so Apple actually pulled that update back. And I heard on Mac OS Ken, it's supposed to be back out uh, this later this week, supposedly. Yeah, again, we don't know how many because there's millions of iPads out there. So if it happens to 0.001%, that's a lot of cranky people. Rightly cranky people. And and full on bricked you don't want. You know, annoyed is fine, but bricked, eh, not so much. Yeah, pretty much, exactly. Uh, Also, if you choose to go to the new OSs, be prepared for a change in nomenclature. Your Apple ID is gone. You now have an Apple account. Probably better, but not an easy change. I guess. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we'll be able to else. find it sprinkled incorrectly in documentation for years to come. Yeah, yeah. The um, um, the I don't know whether are you going to talk at all about the Apple Passwords app? Um, I don't have much to say. I've about got it, one so. quick thing to say about it. Great. So Go for it. you guys have all probably heard that uh, the. Uh, Access to passwords isn't through this clunky keychain interface anymore. It's through a nice, pretty app called Passwords, and that's great. If you have somebody who's not using a password manager at all, and they duplicate their passwords instead of creating weird passwords, and this would help them make weird passwords, I guess that's a good thing. But keep in mind that if you use that, the security of all of your passwords is only as safe as the code on your phone which maybe you have a four-digit code, maybe it's a six-digit code, maybe you've got a long, complex password, but it's your passwords are only as secure as that or the password you have on your Mac. Right? Ish. Because it asks for your login. It, it asks for your, your uh, login to your account on your Mac or your, your passcode if, say, Face ID fails or Touch ID fails. Yeah, actually, yeah, no, yes. Uh, so if you do have a terrible password on your Mac, then yes, actually, yes. 
Um, I have a terrible password on my Mac. Okay. I mean, um, not terrible, but it's not in the, it's not in the top five pass. It's not my one password. I can tell you that. Yeah, my approach is to make my password not too awful and to have delete this device after 10 failed attempts because everything's backed up in iCloud. Mm. But, and yes, but you're right, it is. So it, 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 we're down to the fact that it's better than not doing it for most people, but that doesn't mean it's a utopia. So think carefully about how you protect yeah, and, your and phone. And it's not any different than it was before. This was always true. It's just really obvious now to me that when you open up passwords and it goes, oh, yeah, what's your login for your Mac? I'm like, wait a minute. Now, bear in mind that anyone who's ever clicked save password in Safari ever is in exactly the same situation because where the password is saved hasn't changed. It's just that the user interface has moved from where no one knows it exists to a place where it's obvious. And the other thing that disappoints me a little is... We don't actually have any new core functionality. What Apple have done is made the functionality that's been in iCloud Keychain visible, which I guess is a nice first mm-hmm. step, but there's still a long way to go if they're going to make this a real yeah. password manager. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, fire extinguisher time. Um, so it is one of those true facts that Jill loves so much that there is a bug in an open source product called CUPS, which is the common Unix printing system. And it is a fairly serious bug, but there are a lot of silver linings to the point where it's almost all silver lining and there's not all that much cloud. So first off, it is patched. So patchy, patchy, patch, patch, and your Linux systems Wait, are patch fine. Wait, patch what? Patch where? What operating system? Okay, systems? so Linux. Sorry. Well, okay. Let's start in Linux and then we'll, we'll visit on the, the Mac. Mac. Okay. okay. If we can jump straight to there if you like. Um, there are two well, stories. I just, it didn't say anywhere... Which it, it does was actually in, third in bullet the beginning of it. Oh, okay, um, that's a good point. Actually, Sans Institute just assumed that everyone would know Cups is on Linux. Yeah, I like their headline. It said, "Don't panic." Cups is oh, take that headline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this isn't in the bit of Cups that does printing, which is confusing because it's the common Unix printing system. But on Linux, it does a little bit more than just print things. So on the Mac, the only job Cups has is to print things, whereas on Linux, the Cups has two jobs, and it has two completely different demons. So it has one demon that does printing, and a completely different demon that scans the network looking for shared printers for you. And for some reason, to find shared printers, it opens a port on your machine. Which I still don't understand why you would do things that way around, but okay. And if you enable the feature to tell your Linux machine to scan for printers, then you could potentially be attacked by someone else who's on your local area network, sending UDP packets at that port that you just inadvertently opened up on yourself. But this is all off by default. So if you have a bunch of Linux VMs, you're not going to have turned this on. If you're a Linux desktop user, you might maybe have turned this on, but probably not because you probably have your printer. You probably don't have this feature on looking for shared printers as you're in an office environment, but how many office environments run Linux desktops? So the attack surface seems quite small here, and there's a patch. So yum update, apt get update, and you're golden anyway. So real world impact is likely to be very small. And here in Apple land, where Apple are not particularly known for being quick to patch open source components within Mac OS, it's been their weakness for a while. Here in Mac OS, we only use a bit of cups that does the printing because we find shared devices using a different protocol, which is now called MDNS, which used to have much more fun names like Rendezvous and Bonjour. Um, Mm -hmm. But now it's just MDNS. So it's a completely separate system to CUPS. So this bit of CUPS that has the problem, it just isn't here on the Mac. So we are fine here. Okay, good. So I rearranged the bullets so it says the bug is on the Linux feature first. The bullets Good. just, I just rearranged it so you can see. And so then obvi- it's obvious when it says patch promptly, that'd be on Linux. Okay. Excellent. Brilliant. Right. Next up, if you have a D Link router, uh, log in, check for updates because a bunch of their Wi Fi 6 routers have a pretty nasty flaw that is a hard coded password. That does not seem like a good idea to have a hard coded password. So, should we have a, a, a set, just maybe a, a standard segment in uh, security bits about why D Link is bad at, at uh, routers? 
I mean, it this seems is, like they've heard do one. a search to see how many of them there have been like this. This is ridiculous. It kind of okay. is. And just in case you're forgetting why we care about this, uh, this news wouldn't have made the show notes ordinarily, but it was like, well, no, this has to go here. Chinese botnet infects 260,000 small office home office routers. In other words, those D-Link routers that aren't being patched, a quarter of a million of them are now in a Chinese botnet. That's how this works. Patchy, mm. patchy, patch, patch. Finally, if you are running ChatGPT on the Mac, make sure it is patched. Uh, it had a wee bit of a bug. It had some pretty not so good security implications. So just patch and your grant. So do that. So the, the specific ChatGPT app. Yes, the the app app okay. for macOS. So I'm not sure how big an audience it is. I think a lot of people chat GPT through the web interface. Although there is something well, to be and said, I have an I app guess. called MacGPT. Ah, and it's a different app. There you go. Yeah, no, this is the official one, which didn't exist for a long time, okay. which is probably why Mac G GPT came into being. Um, so there is a patch for chat that app. Yes, it was it was patched okay. and then disclosed. So most people okay. would have auto updated themselves most probably before. Oh no, a new version of Chat GPT is oh. ready to install. It will ah, install okay. that now, and it, it didn't query me. I had to ask for it. All right. Thank you. Disappointing. Uh, where are the warnings then? Uh, I have stopped telling you every time there's a new way to try trick developers because I would tell you every week. But this time it hit XK past WDJS, which we've been working on as a community. So it seemed like this was a worthy time of reminding everyone that as of the last 12 months or so, there has been a surge in watering hole attacks against developers and power users of all kinds, where the, the attackers have decided that we can get our hands on stuff by going after things on GitHub, basically polluting GitHub with malicious stuff. So the latest is comments or GitHub issues. What's a, what's a watering hole attack? It's where you... you, you like it, a honeypot? No, a watering hole is like a crocodile that hides in a place all the bison come. So the bison are coming there anyway. So if you wait there, your dinner will come to you. Developers will come to GitHub. So if you attack there, the developers will come to you. You don't have to try to go to them. So that's the watering hole attack. So a honeypot is different because they're not necessarily there already. Yeah, there's, a honeypot is for attracting things, whereas a watering hole is for where okay, they come anyway. this is just waiting where the... Okay. Yeah. All right. So basically GitHub comments, in this case, it was pretending to be a notification about a security vulnerability in the repository. So they really were targeting the owners of the repository more than users of the repository. But we've had recent stories where they post answers to people asking questions, telling them to run a PowerShell script. In this case, it was your repository is vulnerable, but hey, run this PowerShell script and we'll fix it for you. Both of those things hmm. are a bad idea. Don't run random PowerShell given to you by anyone, anywhere, ever. <laughs> yeah. Or Bash script, or any sort of scripty, really. If you don't understand the code, run away. But just to be aware that the attackers have decided that the positive community on GitHub is a place they can be SOBs. So, yeah, precisely. Uh, a heads up to any of our listeners who rely on Tor to protect themselves. There is, I don't know if this is a problem or not, but the Chaos Computer Club, who are who have a, very, a long history of doing interesting research, and they often find things that are theoretically interesting but practically meaningless. Like they succeeded in some very, very difficult 3D printing and stuff to make a sausage-based fake finger for Touch ID, which had no real-world impact but was a really fun story. Um, they have done a bunch of research on whether or not Tor is efficient at being anonymous, and they actually believe it isn't. The Tor project disagree, and I am not qualified to judge. Link in show notes if this is important to you. Hmm. Okay. Moving on then to notable news. And the first news item, uh, I think you jumped up very loudly. Um, I had also jumped up very loudly when this crossed my stream. NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the United States, have updated their guidance on passwords. Now, you might be thinking, but that's a US group, Bart. Why would you possibly care? Well, 
technically speaking, NIST only applies to US government agencies and contractors supplying stuff to US government agencies. But NIST are really good at their job. So lots and lots and lots and lots of organizations all around the world adopt the NIST advice as if it was their advice because NIST have done such a great job. And so, for example, here in Ireland, we have a different standard with a name that says Ireland in it, but is actually just a copy and paste of NIST with one or two words changed. So I call it NIST with an Irish accent. So whatever NIST do has a huge impact all around the world even though it's technically speaking very, very small influence. But no, it's, it's a big deal. And they have added some common sense to the rules for passwords. Now, I should say that this is for end user passwords, which is an important distinction. This is for passwords for humans. So for listeners of this show, all of you, for people who work as a sysadmin, this does not mean all passwords because you will have passwords used for service accounts or for administrative accounts. They are not covered by this, but it's for user passwords. So don't annoy your human beings is what this comes down to. And a lot of it is turning advice into requirements, which in government language speak is should becomes shall. And shall is legally binding if you are in fact a government agency. So this is a big deal. Except for the fact that NIST actually is only influence. It doesn't actually, they can't, like, they can't uh, hold somebody accountable for not obeying what they say. My understanding is that if you work, say, in the Department of Defense and you break NIST, the Department of Defense will hold you accountable. So NIST won't. That can be true. Right, but NIST, NIST isn't a, a, doesn't have a an enforcement arm. They are Correct. an advisory thing and other organizations can say we will comply with this and if you don't then we slap you upside the head yeah so that yeah exactly other people can choose to enforce NIST on themselves so for example NIST says don't use uh sms to authenticate and every especially if you're a bank and every bank in the united states uses sms so. yes you you can beat them over the head and say oi NIST says you're being dumb but no one's going to force them, which is annoying. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, good news. I wanted this to be a happy story. So uh, mm -hmm. if people who follow NIST are now prohibited, banned from forcing periodic password resets, that is no longer allowed, which is amazing. That came mm -hmm. with a equally sensible other side if an organization has a reason to suspect a password is breached, they now must or shall force a password reset. So don't do it based on time. Do it based on evidence. Seems like a much better good. approach. Good, good, good. Yes. Yeah. There are also bans on password complexity rules in terms of composition. So you can't say This one people, bothers me. Uh, well, it may bother you a little well, bit first. Less. Yeah, so basically okay. you can't say you must use this type of character and these special characters. It's like... You should have every print, you must have every printable ASCII character as allowed, but you can't force mm -hmm. people to mix them. And you should have every UTF-8 printable character allowed. So you should be allowed to use emoji in your passwords, which I know a lot of people <laughs> actually do. But you must so have ASCII. I was okay with this one until the next one that's on your list was that it requires a minimum length of eight characters. So if you go back to the previous one where they can't force complexity, so you can have all lowercase letters and an eight character password and you miss, you meet the NIST requirements. You meet the they requirements, but you're called again, out, you meet sorry, the they, shell. They specifically called out having lower upper and lowercase. You, you're not allowed to force that on people. You're not allowed to force them to have a number in it. Right. So the shall says eight. The should says mm -hmm. 15. But still, the sh so the shall now changed from forcing people to have special characters to not forcing them to have special characters and a minimum of eight, character, eight characters. So I looked it up in uh, Password Haystacks by, by uh, Steve Gibson, uh, 2.17 seconds in an offline attack scenario to crack an eight digit password with only uh, letters. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know why that should and shall are still there. My guess is legacy systems. There are still in existence, particularly in government circles, devices incapable of more than eight characters. 
It's, yeah. it's an odd one. Hopefully the shall is what takes, or should, sorry, is what takes preference here because they're saying you should have 15 characters. And that's a much better approach. The other one I really yeah. like is that if you insist on having a maximum length, you cannot make the, or you should not make that maximum length less than 64. <laughs> which is good. Good. There's also a ban on password hints, which is probably a good idea not to give away. Yeah, it's my dog's name. Uh, well, that's just narrowed down the dictionary here a bit, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, there is also exactly. a ban on knowledge-based authentication, i.e. what was the name of your first pet? What's your mother's maiden name? Oh, these are now just for not allowed. Not allowed. Um, oh, I, I, when I saw password hints, I thought it was that. I guess both. They're, they're, they're now both true. So password hints are gone and knowledge-based authentication is gone. So two thumbs Good. up, one for each. Uh, and like I say, this is for people. So if you have scripts that have passwords in it, it is absolutely perfectly valid to have a forced change of every month that that password lets it change because a script is a dangerous place to have a password. Consider better authentication. Certificate based. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, you, and you can still force admin passwords and stuff. They're not saying you're not allowed to make your, say, domain admin account have an expiration of six months or whatever. It's just the humans. You can't be bothering your humans because research shows it makes them use worse passwords. So your attempt is to right. secure things well, and the effect is to insecure them. And we knew that years ago. When did that report come out from the U.S. government? They did a study where it basically proved that if you make people reset their passwords, they create worse passwords. It's been done, like, it has been repeated so often, I don't know when the first one was. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So what's what's fun about the NIST thing is even uh, people like you in a different country, you're able to use this report to say, see, this is what I've been trying to tell you. NIST yes. says so. And so yes. people are... Um, uh, commenting in our, our Slack at podfee.com slash Slack uh, about how, okay, I'm going to take this report and take it to my blank and show it to him and say, please, please stop doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It is a trusted organization. When they give advice, it has weight. Thank goodness. Good. Uh, okay. Next up, a little bit of good news. Uh, so the RCS standard is managed by a group called the GSMA. And so the RCS standard is a cross cell provider messaging system that is now supported by iOS 18 and has been supported by Android for ages and ages and ages. And anyway, GSMA stands for GSM Association. Thanks for your help. But at least oh, it gives us a little more information. Recursive acronym. Lovely. Yeah. Or nested, not recursive. Um, and one of the things that people may not realize is that the official standard does not have a mechanism for encryption. Google invented their own custom encryption protocol and added that to Android. So Android to Android can be encrypted, but it's not part of RCS. It's an Android feature, not an RCS feature, which is why it doesn't work across to iPhones. Oh. Okay, everybody's been blaming Apple for that, saying, why didn't Apple do it end-to-end -end encryption? Because it doesn't exist oh, in the that's standard. that's really interesting. Okay. Well, they've I mean, decided... I suppose they could have implemented... But they could have implemented Google's not standard standard. That's a dangerous thing to do, because then if you're a worldwide company, that starts to get a bit, will that break stuff over here and will that break stuff over there? And the European Union might get a bit cranky, because what if there's a carrier in Europe where it doesn't work or something, and now Apple are breaking the you know, one of the new laws. Either way, the good news is the standards body who run the RCS standard have gone, oh, maybe we should make a standard, like an actual standard standard for end-to-end -end encryption so that everyone can do it the same way and have full interoperability. Good. Thank you. So this, is, late this is a fixing to make a plan, though. It doesn't exist yet. Yeah, but hey, you know, GSM so agencies, news. yeah, GSM agencies don't move fast. At least they're moving. They have, motion has commenced in the correct direction. Um, less good news, the Federal Trade Commission, so not the FCC, we talked about earlier, this is the FTC, they did a giant big report into what do social media companies actually do in terms of the accounts of kids and teens and are they keeping to the letter or spirit of COPA or any other relevant laws? No. No, they're not. They're making money hand over fist, selling the data of kids. They don't have enforcement right. power, but the report 
might light a fire under someone who does. If you'd like to know more. Okay. Hey, can I back us up to sure. uh, talk about RCS just for one quick second yeah. to say something good about iOS 18? Um, I okay. turned it on, I, I wouldn't put a iOS 18 on and uh, Rod Simmons' entire family is on uh, iOS and he's on Android and I so I texted him and I said, here's a full res video. Can you see it? And he could. And he sent me a full res video and I could see it. And he wrote back, he said, I'm so happy I could cry because Aww. what he's had to do with his family is he always had to upload it to Google services and then send them a link. And right. it's just like, here's some stupid video of, you know, my kid playing basketball or something. And and uh, so the, the, it is, it is a really good thing that, that we've got uh, GSM now that, that if you deal with a lot of Android people and you want to be able to play, play with them back and forth, it is a good reason to, uh, to go to iOS 18. Excellent. That's a very United States thing because it, particularly in Europe, we just all use uh, Telegram or not Telegram, uh, the, the green WhatsApp. one. WhatsApp. Yeah. WhatsApp. Sorry, it's the green icon. <laughs> I'm terrible like that. Mm -hmm. The blue icon is for chatting to Alison. The green icon is for chatting to family. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, where was I? Ah, yes. Uh, our friends at Noib, which is a privacy group, which stands for None of Your Business, which is a good name. Well, it's a good name. It's a terrible acronym, N-O-Y-B. Um, they have filed a lawsuit against Mozilla, who are not the kind of company you usually expect to be sued by a privacy advocacy group. And I did a bit of reading on this going, what? why would Mozilla be in the line of fire here? And the conclusion I have drawn is that this is a battle between idealists and realists. So mm. Mozilla have developed a technology where they use the browser to anonymously track the effectiveness of ads and give that anonymous data back to the advertisers in the hope that that will stop them using evil tracking because, hey, at least they can get their advertising stuff this way. So the idea being the web doesn't have to completely be changed, but we can have privacy. And the privacy advocates feel that, well, okay, it's different tracking, but we don't want anyone, not even the browser, to be collecting this information anywhere, not even on your own device. So idealist versus, I guess, a pragmatist, which is what Mozilla are being. So I don't think anyone's being evil here. It okay. will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, and I think there's some sort of a conservation of AI training momentum or something in the United States. Because I had two stories that I just was like, what? Is it like one out, one in? So Meta said, we are going to start using the data of UK, Facebook and Instagram users to train our AI. It's like, oh, that's not good. And LinkedIn went, we are stopping using UK data to train our AI because we think we're about to get in trouble with the information protection commissioners. So maybe there's only room for so many of them. I mean, it's, a, it's a finite space. If somebody at any point in time has to be abusing your privacy. Good. Clearly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, oh, my show notes say apply and meta. That's another typo. Apple and meta have opted out okay. of the EU's voluntary responsible code for AI or AI code for responsible computing or code for responsible AI computing. I can't remember what the bloody thing is called. But anyway, it's an optional list of things that probably doesn't but have any But they've opted out. But they've opted not they to do it. They don't want to do responsible AI code or they just don't want to play in this particular... I think, yeah. well, in the case of Apple, it's this particular sand pit. In the case of Meta, I shall reserve all comment. <laughs> and then we have some nice, because after all that, I thought, let's collect all the good news together. A whole bunch of software has gotten a little bit better. So Discord now has end-to-end -end encryption. So nice. The Google Password Manager will now automatically synchronize passkeys. Again, nice bit of future. Google Chrome have updated their permissions interfaces so that instead of having to say yes or no forever, you now have an Apple style once only, please, when a website asks for permission. So again, nice. And uh, Windows Server 2005, which is obviously a preview of what's coming, but they are adding a feature that has existed in Unix and then in Linux for a long time where you can update the kernel of your operating system without rebooting. It sounds like magic because effectively it's like changing the tablecloth while you're eating your dinner, but it works. Or a heart I, transplant while you're having a conversation driving a car. 
Right. But it works. We do this on our mm. Linux servers and work all the time now. It's just become completely normal on the on recent versions of Red Hat. And it is now coming to Windows Server first. So my hope is that if it comes to Windows Server, it will flow down to Windows 11 not too long from now. And then rebooting for Windows updates will become a thing of the past. You can just update. The amount of friction it removes to be able to just update is, it's a huge difference. People hate rebooting. So I hope this comes to everyone. Um, In terms of top tips then, uh, one of the nice new privacy related features in the latest iOS's is the ability to either lock and or hide apps. So this is particularly important for parents who may give their phone to their kids to futz about on and also have, say, their work outlook installed. And maybe you don't Mm. want a four-year-old texting your boss about the poop in their pants or God knows what. So this is just a good feature that you should know about. Um, and then, I hadn't thought of it for that reason. That's, that's a great reason. Yeah. And then interesting insights. Um, Troy Hunt has been on a roll with interesting blog posts. And he's written, it's a long read. Make yourself a cup of coffee, sit down. Uh, but he's made a very thoughtful post on data on whether or not you should disclose when you've had a breach. And he starts off by pointing out that the law is nowhere near as strict as we all think it is. And I'm guilty of this too. I found myself reading along going, but the GDPR forces disclosure. And Troy pointed to weasel words. When there is a risk of genuine harm. Oh, lawyers can have a lot of fun with that kind of weasel word. So actually, the onus to report is a lot weaker than I realized, and I think than a lot of people realize. But, Troy makes a very good point, you should disclose anyway, because it's in the best interest of your company to do it now, because it is going to happen. And you can either do it in a way that will get you plaudits from your users for being responsible, or end up with egg on your face. Choose. Mm. And there is now very strong evidence that everyone assumes data breaches are going to happen. So people are not angry with companies for being breached anymore. That ship has sailed. People are now angry when you don't tell them. So okay. the incentive is very clear. If you're paying any attention at all, you should do responsible disclosure of breaches because it is better for you, even if it's not legally mandated. So that's well, good. That sounds like what you've been saying for quite a while. It does, but I hadn't realized how weak the laws were. So I like I agreed with all of the, everything that came after, but in the first half of the post, I was like, "Eep, meep." Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> As I say, always good. Now I have a palate cleanser. Do you? Did you add anything to the show notes since I refreshed? I did add one, but you go Aha. first. Okay, so I have so many shades of nostalgia for this app. You won't because you're not a music person, but I have massive nostalgia for a wonderful app called Winamp, which played all of my MP3s for years and years and years and years. And that app sort of died a slow death on Windows and then I moved to the Mac and it died a complete death for me. Anyway, the code has now, 20 odd years later, been open sourced and they're asking for help to modernize the app and bring back Winamp to modern Windows operating systems. So that's so fun. That's just fun. I don't care who you are. That's fun. I love stuff like that. All right. Well, since I mentioned Clippy, I decided to throw in a, uh, a, there's a woman named Ellie Cordova or L Cordova. And she does videos on uh, space things and technology things. And it's one of, she does those kind of videos where she plays a bunch of different characters. And so you see above her head who she's being when she's doing this different thing. <laughs> she did one on digital assistants, like the S lady and A lady. And, and uh, she b- brings in Cortana, GPT-4. It is oh. absolutely hilarious. The, the end of it will, will make you spit coffee out your nose if you happen to be drinking it at the time. <laughs> so it's it's delightful. If you don't like TikTok, you can also find her on, on Instagram. So I, I I didn't put a link to the Instagram one, but uh, I gave it to you on TikTok. It's, it's very funny. It's entitled Server Break Room. Okay, cool. I will enjoy that later. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Alison. All righty. Well, palette cleansed. Uh, we've uh, fire extinguisher. This as as uh, security bits goes. This is pretty nice. 
Yeah, actually, I was. I, yeah, now that you say it, this has been a, a decent two weeks of cybersecurity. Let's hope for more of the same. But remember, folks, regardless of what happens in the next two weeks, there's one thing you always have to remember to do. Stay patched so you stay secure. Now, it was a while ago that you guys heard this, but you might have found it ironic that I complained about the audio hijack and uh, all the Rogue Amoeba tools right after telling you how great they are. We just went into a firestorm of weird. I don't I don't blame them. Um, I don't know what was going on. It was it was very, very strange. But I will give one more plug for audio hijack. As I've mentioned a bunch of times, I record my side and Bart's side on two separate tracks and I separate them and put them on, into the show. Bart does the same thing. And so I actually take the clean version of him and the clean version of me from our two recordings and I discard the other, the other half of each one. But one of the reasons we do that is it's a belt and suspenders approach to doing the recording. And because we've been faffing about so much with all these different controls, I never hit my record button. So the reason you just heard security bits and heard, more importantly, heard both sides of security bits is because Bart and I both do double enders and we record both, so we record both sides. So anyway, it does end up still being an ad for Rogue Amoeba. But that is going to wind us up for this week now. Did you know you can email me at allison at podv.com anytime you like? If you have a question or a suggestion, just send it on over. Oh, I just remembered something really important. There's no live show next week. We will not be here next week, and the show's going to come out early on Wednesday. All right, now you can remember everything good starts with podfeed.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed.com slash Mastodon. If you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube like the kids do today, you can go to podfeed.com slash YouTube. If you want to join the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeed.com slash Slack, and you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways there. You can even go thank Helma for all of her hard work on programming by Stealth. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, not next week, but the week after that, head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.